On this episode of Diesel Insights, we're going to switch it up. We're going to go to the 3.0 liter Duramax. That's right, the LM2. We're going to talk about the turbocharger, the sizes, what it is, and what that means for power potential. Okay, the 2020 truck behind me here, 3.0 liter Duramax, common rail fuel injected, 36,000 pounds of rail pressure. Nasty little truck, 1500 series, it makes 277 horsepower rated. On our dyno, we're seeing about 255 at the rear wheels. I picked up a GM version of the LM2 turbocharger. We took it apart because I wanted to see what it's made of, and I figured I'd share that with you guys. The cool thing about the LM2 is that this turbocharger is one of the most accessible that I've seen in a late model truck. I mean, you can literally pop the hood and see the turbocharger staring right back at you. That's pretty cool. Nice people to get access to something for a change. Thanks, GM. Okay, so what do we have here? Well, it's a single turbocharger. It's right on top of the motor. It's on the passenger side of the engine. It is a Garrett. Looks about a GT20, GT22 frame size. So it's bigger than the turbocharger that was on the 2.8 liter. Um, we're looking at stock, about a 42.3 millimeter compressor. It's a six blade compressor. Pretty cool compressor wheel. It's got a, uh, it's got a coating on it, which I haven't seen before from anything on GM's lineup. It looks like, I haven't taken the rotating assembly apart yet, but it looks like it's a ball bearing unit. Turbine size, we're looking at a 44 by 49 with eight millimeter wide vein cage. So all of the exhaust gas in the engine flows into this turbine housing and then around the volute, and then acts upon the turbine via this vein cage unit here. And this is real common. This is the same kind of style they use on the 2.8 and the L5P. It's got a nozzle ring assembly, fairly small. Uh, like I said, eight millimeters tall. The reason they use these variable geometry turbochargers is so that uh, the factory can change the uh, pressure in the exhaust stream and affect exhaust gas flow at low throttle inputs and near idle. It also makes for a truck that can use grade braking, uh, so that you can close up those veins and use the turbine brake to really load up the exhaust with pressure and get a lot of uh, braking force out of the engine. So that's a nice feature. It also makes for a quick responding truck. When these veins are closed, you get a really narrow, sharp nozzle with a lot of pressure acting on that turbine and gets spun up nice and quick. And then they're gonna open up and let plenty of exhaust gas flow through onto the turbo for that high flow, high load scenario. That nozzle ring or variable geometry assembly on this turbocharger is connected externally with a rod similar to the L5P. And uh, that, that mechanism is driven off this servo motor, which is all mounted externally. Very nice feature. What we've noticed in performance turbocharger building is that the actuators that tend to last the longest are the ones that are mounted external to the turbocharger and are not you know, physically bolted or cooled using coolant from the turbocharger. So nice to see them continue to use this style servo. Uh, it's not the same servo that's on the L5P. Actually, it looks a lot like the 2020 Power Stroke. I'm not going to say it's the same one, but it looks similar to that. Another interesting thing on the compressor side. So we're used to seeing kind of a shorter run of air into the compressor cover. On this 3 liter, we have kind of a longer run in the casting. And then we have a lack of a traditional anti-surge. So normally there's a groove that's cut in this compressor cover and air kind of recirculates through that groove back around to the front of the compressor wheel to, to widen out the compressor map and uh, restrict the potential for, for surge. So surge is a pulsation in the compressor side while towing. The interesting thing about the 3.0 is that it gets its EGR after the DPF, which means that the EGR is clean and free of soot. One of the newer style EGR systems, it does not recirculate any soot through the engine, only diesel exhaust, so clean diesel exhaust basically. This port right here on the side of the turbo, which is something we don't usually see on uh, these late model trucks, is where the EGR comes directly into the face of the turbocharger and not downstream like in the earlier generations. Let's talk about how this turbocharger performs on the truck. So I have a camera on our CTS and our CTS has some good PIDs on it. So upper left-hand corner is your total boost pressure. Subtract about 14 and a half from that and you'll get actual boost that you would see on a gauge. Right below that where it says pre-turbo, that is the pressure in the exhaust housing just before the vane set. So that would typically be called drive pressure. Although in this case, you'll see another PID right below that which is called post-turbo 
post turbo is the pressure behind the turbocharger in the downpipe. So because this truck is emissions equipped, it has pressure in the exhaust system. So we're gonna subtract that post turbo pressure from the drive pressure to get actual drive pressure. The reason we have drive pressure and boost pressure and uh, pressure in the downpipe is so that we can get a good idea of how hard the turbocharger is working in factory shape. By factory shape, I mean this truck has a tune. Uh, it's about 40 horsepower tune, so about 285, 290 to the rear tires. It's a nice balance between really pushing the truck hard and having something that's long-term reliable. I will tell you that the factory calibration engineers on this truck uh, allow the uh, allow the engine to run quite rich at full load. So uh, typically on a diesel, you'll see a 16 to one air fuel ratio is kind of the, the minimum, maybe 15 and a half. On this truck, you'll see uh, close to 14 and a half. Uh, so 1.0 Lambda, even 0.95 Lambda in some cases. What that means is that you're, you're getting a lot of fuel per air, so stoichiometrically fairly rich. For you guys who've been watching these things and know about turbochargers and are curious, first thing you're gonna ask me is, okay, how much boost does this thing make? How much boost is it capable of? And what kind of drive pressure are we talking about? So upper left-hand corner, right, as I start to roll into the throttle, you see boost climb up. So 48, 50, it's kind of peak. Right, subtract 15 from that. So 34, 35 pounds of boost is about the peak that we're seeing at this point in this tune. I mean, keep in mind, we're trying to manage that lambda, so we're trying to get enough air into the cylinder to keep the truck running um, not super rich. So we're gonna try and keep regen frequency down, of course. Uh, you can see as I lean on the truck that pre-turbo pressure isn't that high. So for 30 pounds of boost, we're about 30 pounds of pre-turbo pressure, even less than that. So to have a one-to-one -one boost to drive ratio is a pretty nice feature. What that tells me is that we really haven't started pushing the turbocharger that hard yet. Meaning that if we need a little bit more air, we can probably lean on it a little bit harder and, and get a little bit more air. Uh, as we continue tuning this platform and continue pushing it, of course, we're gonna watch those pids and get a handle on Okay, you know, if we're at one to one at 285, 290 horsepower, when does it start to go to 1.2 to one, 1.3 to one, 1.5 to one? And start to see when we're starting to use a lot of that drive energy to get minimal boost improvement. And also, the compressor on the truck is only going to be efficient probably into the you know 40 psi range. Um, we'll start to see that as well in the. Uh, intercooler temperature. So below the pre-turbo you have the post-turbo and let's just talk about that for a minute. So that's a good sign of how well the emission system is tolerating uh, the amount of power that we're making. When we're seeing high post-turbo pressures they're going to take away from the ability of the turbine section to, to make energy, to move air, to make, make boost. So what I like to do is uh, install a probe there and run the truck. So below that PID you'll see, below the post-turbo PID you'll see the DPF. So you got two pressure systems there. There's the DPF alone and then there's the total exhaust. So as I womp on the truck, you'll see there's about four PSI, five PSI pressure across the DPF and about nine, nine and a half, eh, right around 10 in the, deep, uh, in the full exhaust system. So that's the, the SCR, everything, the DOC, all of it. You might say 10 PSI, wow, that's, that's a lot of pressure in the exhaust system. Well, it's not insignificant for sure, but it's not uh, anything higher than we've seen on the late model Ford or the late model Duramax making, uh, making high power. So on those trucks, we've seen closer to 15 PSI as we really start to lean on them. And that's kind of where we see it. And the law of diminishing returns. So as we add more fuel, we add more boost, we have to clamp the veins down. And basically we're handicapped by the pressure in the exhaust system. All good stuff for now. One of the interesting things driving the truck tuned versus stock is that stock, this truck really takes advantage of the oh, very wide operating range. So RPM wise, I mean, we're running all the way out to 4,000, 4,100 on the shifts. On the 6.6 .6 Duramax, we're shifting right at 3,000, sometimes even below that at full throttle. So it's a totally different driving experience. You go ahead and hit the throttle on this thing while you're rolling and it's gonna drop two gears and it's gonna pick up RPM and it's gonna use engine speed to make power. You can either use boost or engine speed to make power. In this case, this truck, I would say, leans towards engine speed. It likes to rev. 
as a diesel owner, as a diesel driver, a diesel tuner, I like to take advantage of torque available. I prefer not to rev the engine any higher than I need to. So it's nice to be able to add torque. And in this tune, we've added about 100 foot pounds of torque. And what that does is allow the truck to lug. And especially with transmission tuning and being able to lock the converter clutch up, the system works really well. So I can pick basically where I shift the truck by how far I put my foot into the throttle. And if I don't want to shift it all the way out of 4,100 RPM, I can just leave my foot in it maybe 60%, 65% shift it early and still get a lot of torque and still pull and still have a really fun truck to drive that feels like a diesel, doesn't have that gas, high revving, naturally aspirated feel that I, I, I kind of feel like the truck had stock. So what are some of the takeaways here? Well, the turbocharger is definitely happy at the power level that we're at right now, that 285 horsepower, 290 rear wheel horsepower. Um, she's, she's working really well. The emission system seems happy. The truck seems really happy. And we're instrumented the thing for data. We know what it likes. We know what it doesn't like. Of course, we're going to continue to lean on it, continue to develop those tunes, continue to see how well the emission system tolerates it, the rest of the systems tolerate it, and see when we start to run out of air. So all things looking pretty cool so far. I'm excited to see really where the limit of the turbocharger is and see what kind of specs we get when we get close to that limit and then get a game plan together to build something a little bit bigger. That's phase one. Hope you enjoyed this Diesel Insights. If you did, please click subscribe. We'll catch you in the next one.